Bonjour, je m'appelle Mike Vial. Je suis professeur d'économie et directeur académique du Centre des données de recherche à McMaster University. J'ai aussi l'honneur d'être chercheur principal du réseau et membre du conseil d'administration. Il me fait plaisir, au nom de RCCDR, de souhaiter la bienvenue à tous nos participants canadiens et internationaux. Nous sommes très heureux que vous soyez des nôtres pour cette conférence virtuelle présentée en partenariat avec Statistique Canada. This week's series addresses cross-cutting research and policy priorities, and today the spotlight is on poverty, homelessness, and housing issues. It is my pleasure to welcome four panelists who will share their experience of how the CRDCM is advancing their research and informing policies that relates to these important societal and economic issues. They will discuss the role of the CRDCN in enabling policy-related analysis on key cultural, socioeconomic, and health issues in the pursuit of a just, equitable, and inclusive Canada. They will also share their aspirations for future data, research, and policy development. Each of our panelists will present opening remarks of six to seven minutes. As this portion of the panel has been pre-recorded, we invite you to submit your questions as you listen to each speaker. We will get to as many of them as possible in the live Q&A that will follow. I now invite my colleague, Jim Dunn, Professor and Chair of the Department of Health, Aging and Society at McMaster University and a scientist at the Center for Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto to kick off today's panel. Jim holds the Senator William McMaster Chair in Urban Health Equity at McMaster and is the Director of the McMaster Institute for Health Equity. He has worked closely with governments at all levels to address issues related to income security, housing, mobility, and health. Jim will speak for approximately six to seven minutes. Jim, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. I'm happy to be here today. So uh, I'd like to structure my uh, comments today uh, based on my own experience of what was uh, in terms of the data infrastructure in Canada, uh, and in particular Statistics Canada data, what is and what will be hopefully in the future. And uh, in the case of the what was and the what is, I actually have a couple of uh, personal natural experiments in a sense where I've done the same research uh, prior to the uh, development of the RDCs and then again after the development of the RDCs. And so it gives me a, um, uh, it's an indication of my age, of course, and also an indication of, uh, of just how far we've come. So back in the early, late 90s and early 2000s, I was involved with a group uh, that was working on income inequality and population health and essentially it was asking the question are unequal places less healthy than more egalitarian ones and it was uh, an extension of the work that had been popularized by Richard Wilkinson from the UK and has become uh, even more popular since then and uh, the work was initiated by Michael Wilson who at the time was assistant chief statistician and we were able to do the work it was uh, Nancy Ross and I who were or uh, mostly the leads. Nancy was working in Michael's group at Statistics Canada at the time and now she of course is at McGill University in the Department of Geography and she's Associate Vice Principal for Research. But Nancy and I led this work on income inequality and health in Canadian provinces and in Canadian cities, uh, metropolitan areas, and the work was really only possible because Nancy sat there inside Statistics Canada in the cookie jar, if you like, of, um, uh, of the data. And, uh, and we actually produced quite a lot of work and it was uh, very influential, including uh, a very highly cited paper in the British Medical Journal. And uh, more recently, um, in terms of what is in that particular strain of research, uh, I resurrected some of that research so that we can uh, update it and, uh, and um, get more recent uh, information. And we're able to do that through the RDCs now. We don't have to have these um, close relationships with uh, Inside Statistics Canada and arm twist and, uh, and persuade people inside Statistics Canada to take an interest in the particular research question. And so we're able to do it now in the RDCs and uh, it's been actually qu quite a, a fascinating experience to see that kind of transition. Um, I was also around in the very, very early days of um, the predecessor to CanCheck, so, uh, which at the time was called the Census Mortality Linkage uh, Link Database. And it's a, 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 many people will know and be familiar with this data set, but it's a 15% sample of the um, people who filled out the long form of the census initially in 1991, and then linkage to their mortality records with uh, and the 91 now has uh, many years of follow-up, uh, well, probably more than 20 years of follow-up. 
And so we did some work with Russell Wilkins uh, using that census mortality linkage, and it was on housing. Um, and Russell had uh, has gone through and identified um, marginal housing statuses in the census. So people who lived in hotels or campgrounds or other kinds of mar shelters, other kinds of marginal housing uh, situations. And we were interested in whether, what the magnitude of the mortality disadvantage was in that. And we pro it proved to be quite large. And, uh, and that was a very successful study that was also published in the British Medical Journal. Um, and what's uh, interesting now is that I've got two PhD students who are much more easily able to use that uh, census mortality linkage because Chan CanCheck is readily available through the RDC. Um, uh, one of my students, uh, Chunga Kim, is uh, working on policy regimes, social spending, and suicide in Canadian provinces and has a paper that uh, has recently been finished in, in that area. Uh, another of my students will be using CanCheck to look at uh, housing uh, status and uh, especially around home ownership and future mortality amongst uh, older populations in Canada. She's just in the early days. Her name is Gum Ryong Kim, or Gum Ryong Park, pardon me. And um, uh, I suppose also in the, the realm of what is, uh, some of my research has benefited uh, also from the existence of the RDCs in the development of the Canadian Marginalization Index. So this is a, an initiative that uh, was led by Flora Matheson and I from St. Mike's. Uh, and initially it was, um, it was work that we were doing, uh, on neighborhood determinants of health and in particular interested in gender differences in neighborhood determinants of health. And, um, at the beginning of the project, we had, uh, to decide, well, what are the neighborhood factors that we're going to look at from the census? And, um, rather than sort of picking our favorite census characteristics, which is a, a common practice, uh, we decided to, uh, pick a pretty broad swath of indicators that had some theoretical coherence and then use factor analysis to try and identify which were the ones that uh, that made the most sense. And ultimately that led us to the point where we were able to um, create an index, give it a name, and then uh, make it available uh, more generally. So the Canadian Marginalization Index and the Ontario version of it, the Ontario Marginalization Index, are now pretty widely used um, in a number of different areas, uh, but particularly in health, but also in education. And so uh, we're very pleased that that's uh, been the case and it was also made possible by the uh, RDC. Um, some, in terms of what will be, um, I'll talk first about what I would s describe as a near miss. Um, so uh, I worked, uh, co-led a team uh, with Stephen Huang from St. Michael's Hospital uh, to evaluate the Ontario basic income pilot in uh, 2017 and 2018. Uh, it, of course, was uh, prematurely cancelled uh, by the incoming government. And uh, one of the things that we had imagined, and this, this was the near miss, uh, is that we would be able to use um, uh, our, bring our census, to, uh, sorry, our data from surveys with our population into the RDCs and be able to link uh, to other data sources, in particular tax filer records and so forth. That, of course, didn't come uh, to fruition, but um, out of that experience and uh, having done all that planning for that work, we have uh, now settled upon some legacy projects, including one that's going to be uh, conducted by Robbie Bryden, who works uh, in my group at McMaster on looking at the impact of the Canada Child Benefit and health, so health of uh, and health service utilization uh, in particular of parents. So we'll, uh, we'll be looking at that using some of the linked data sets that are available in the RDC and we're optimistic that uh, at some point in the future there'll be even more data available for us. Also looking forward, um, one of the things that I've been working on over the last several months is, was a proposal uh, to the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation and uh, SHRC, and it was a partnership grant uh, on housing. And so essentially CMHC is trying to seed a new academic network, research network around housing. And uh, they were seeking proposals for groups to um, be the coordinating hub for knowledge mobilization and capacity building. And on the capacity building side of things, we uh, started working closely with um, Statistics Canada, and in particular, um, their uh, group that's working on building out housing data. So they're one of the newest products in the housing uh, data infrastructure world is uh, the National Housing Survey, which was just released in the last few months. 
for regular use, but there's a whole host of other data that uh, that they're working on building, and uh, and they've got funding from CMHC to do this. And this was a really interesting experience, and I think also kind of a, a harbinger of what we might hope for in the future. So essentially, it's tightly tied to the implementation of the National Housing Strategy. So the National Housing Strategy is a 10-year program uh, that's still in its early stages, and um, what is really quite fascinating about this is the work that Statistics Canada is doing is essentially building a data infrastructure that will help to evaluate and understand the impacts of the National Housing Strategy over uh, it, the duration of the, the policy. And then um, our group, uh, which is called the Canadian Housing Evidence Collaborative, is uh, going to be in a position to help build capacity to do that. So we will, uh, our group will be driving users to the Statistics Canada data from the university sector through the RDCs. And so this is a really uh, fantastic partnership. We also have close relationships with a number of stakeholders in the housing system, including about eight national housing organizations, such as the National Housing uh, Home Builders Association, the, Can the um, Canadian Co-op Association, those sorts of things. And so we're uh, very excited about the possibilities for that going into the future and the um, incredible opportunities that will exist for students, for um, knowledge users, and, uh, and for researchers uh, to be able to use RDC data. And so really, uh, you know, I'm really, really excited about the possibilities. We've got um, many, many opportunities for further building the secondary data ecosystem and, uh, in it, and new models for ways that we can uh, collaborate between academic researchers, between Statistics Canada and government, as well as external stakeholders. And uh, the future is very bright, and I'm looking forward to being uh, heavily involved in it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thanks. I very much enjoyed your discussion of what it was like before RDCs, and we certainly agree about how much data access has improved. Our next speaker is Valerie Tarasek, a professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto. Valerie's research extends to Canadian food policy and population level dietary assessment, but her primary focus is household food insecurity. She has led several Tri Council research grants to elucidate the scope, nature, and health implications of this problem in Canada assess the effectiveness of community responses, and determine how public policies and programs impact food insecurity prevalence and severity. Valerie, over to you, approximately six to seven minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to animate my presentation with some slides, so please bear with me as I share my screen with you. So I'm starting with a little definition of food insecurity, um, which, is an experience-based measure of material deprivation, capturing inadequate or insecure access to food due to financial constraints. On this slide, I'm also showing you a very popular image, or one of many images, of food insecurity in our society. Um, since the get-go, food insecurity has been understood in relationship to food bank usage. That continues to be the public face of the problem. Um, and there's a reason for that. Here you see a little timeline of food banks in Canada. The first one most recently happening in 1981, and then um, hunger counts beginning to appear in 1989, and then on consecutive years from 1997 forward. Those are head counts of people using food banks. It wasn't until 1994 that there was any measurement of this problem on, on population surveys, and that was a very simple question on the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth. After that, we had a rather embarrassing period where um, there were questions about food insecurity on population surveys, but there were different questions each time. And it wasn't until 2005 that we actually saw Canada commit to monitoring food insecurity, um, putting a standardized validated instrument on the Canadian Community Health Survey. And I offer you this timeline because it really is the beginning of the wonders of work in the RDC. What have we got? Well, most recently, looking at the Canadian Community Health Survey from 2017-18 um, in the RDC, here's what we can see. Food insecurity is a huge problem in Canada, affecting roughly one in eight households. Um, that translates into 4.4 million um, people, and that is likely an underestimate. And remember, this is pre-COVID. So one of the first learnings that we got from being able to look at population data in the RDC was this. 
This is another learning that has come only from our ability to access data on food insecurity in the RDC system. And that is the headcount of how many people are struggling to manage this problem versus how many are um, using food banks. And you can see there's a gross disconnect among the learnings that has come from the work on food insecurity that's happened through the research data centers is this, that not while well, food banks remain the public face of food insecurity, the problem is way bigger and way more serious. Here you see just a laundry list of uh, understanding of who's got the problem. It predictably, it moves with um, other markers of social and economic disadvantage, and um, yet it's a unique subset of those who are trapped in social and economic um, disadvantage. There have been a, a huge number of studies looking at the relationship between food insecurity and health. And again, this is work that could only happen with the richness of data available to us in the RDCs with this um, consistent measurement since 2005. In the beginning, um, we saw work from McIntyre and her colleagues looking at the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth. That's our one longitudinal data set. And what you can see is tremendous advances in terms of understanding the long-term impact of this problem for um, young people in Canada. Then a string of studies looking at nutrition and health um, more broadly. Um, more recently, studies taking advantage of the opportunities that now um, uh, have arrived with the linkage of the Canadian Community Health Survey to the Discharge Abstract Database, the Canadian Vital Statistics Database, um, and more recently, NACRS. So we're starting to see more and more exploitation of those opportunities. Taken together, this body of work, and I've got a little disclaimer at the bottom of this slide, this is by no means an exhaustive list of the papers that have been published over the last decade or so with access to data through the scenic system. But what the takeaway is, is indisputable, I think. Food insecurity is a potent social determinant of health and of healthcare use in Canada. And that is independent of other um, well-established social determinants of health like income and education. Where we've also been able to make tremendous advances thanks to the richness of data available to us through the RDCs is in looking at the relationship between food insecurity and public policy. And I would suggest to you that this is absolutely a problem of public policy. But with the ability to pool multiple years of survey data in the RDCs, we're able to tease apart the impact of things like the implementation of Nutrition NOR on food insecurity and none of it, or the Canadian Child Benefit and how it impacted food insecurity or didn't impact food insecurity amongst low-income families. There have also been some really important studies done by um, Herb Emery and Lynn McIntyre looking at the effect of old age pensions. As you might have noticed earlier, one of the groups that is protected or the group that consistently appears to be protected from this very terrible problem of food insecurity are Canadian seniors. It looks like that's why. There have also been other studies looking at provincial policies, particularly the powerful effect of Newfoundland's poverty reduction strategy on food insecurity in that province. Again, this list is not exhaustive, but I offer it to you in part to try to impress upon you the potential for um, meaningful policy relevant research, timely meaningful policy relevant research on food insecurity in Canada using the data sets that are available to us. What's the frontier look like? Well, I think there maybe are three parts to this frontier. I think we have the potential to um, go much further in exploiting the opportunities from the linkage of the Canadian Community Health Survey with administrative data. And uh, I sh have highlighted a couple of examples with administrative health data, but I think there is a lot of possibility with the linkage of survey data to the income tax files. With that, we will be able to get direct measures of policy exposure. If you look at the um, studies I have cited relating food insecurity to public policy, what you'll see that they have in common is a lot of gymnastics because we've been working up until now to make inferences about you know, the impact of a policy on this problem by piecing together understanding from multiple um, cycles of a cross-sectional population health survey. Linkage to the income tax files will enable us to go beyond that to actually look at the receipt of particular policies and the impact. 
related to this problem of inferring causal, cause and effect is the desperate need for longitudinal data. Um, up until now, as I said, everything we've got is cross-sectional. We have huge sample sizes with the Canadian Community Health Survey in particular, and more recently now with the Canadian Income Survey, but they're cross-sectional. And so the frontier, another frontier for us, that's really, really critical, I think, in nailing down the, the effects of this problem and the effects of policy on this problem is longitudinal data. And with all of that, there is a need to continue to build capacity in the use of these data. And for that, of course, I am eternally grateful to the RDCs and to even them, including me in the session this afternoon. Okay, but where is it all headed? Of course, the end goal here is um, to see the adoption of this metric and this problem in the development of policy. It isn't enough for us to continue to chart the devastating health impacts of food insecurity, particularly severe food insecurity on the health of Canadians, nor is it sufficient for us to continue to chart the rise of this problem or its total and utter disconnect from many of the initiatives happening at the community level. Um, what's needed truly are, um, is for data to start to inform policy, for evidence to start to inform policy, and that ultimately is the frontier that I think we are edging closer to with the opportunities um, that we get through work in the RDCs. That's it. Thank you. And I hear Valerie's work uh, and read it. I always have mixed feelings because I'm somewhat depressed by the degree of the problem that she discusses. Yet at the same time, I'm inspired by her dedication and her accomplishment in documenting that problem. And I always like to believe that research can be the foundation for hope. Our next speaker is Krishna Pendiker, Professor of Economics at Simon Fraser University. Krishna has focused his research on improving various aspects of the measurement of consumer welfare, inequality, poverty, and discrimination, both within and across households, in Canada, and in the developing world, including immigrant, visible minorities, and indigenous disparity in Canada and elsewhere. Krishna will speak for six to seven minutes. Krishna. Krishna Pendikor, I'm a professor of economics at Simon Fraser University. Um, and I wanna talk about uh, the RDC in the past, the RDC in the present, and what I wish for the RDC in the future. I'm gonna share some slides with you to uh, kind of help me along with my story. So um, I've been working with the RDCs for uh, 20 years, uh, all the way since uh, the beginning. Um, and in fact, I've been working on uh, microdata of the form that the RDC has even in the before time. Uh, so I started working with these kind of data in the 1990s and before the RDCs existed, the only way to use uh, something like census data was to use the public use microdata. And uh, my brother, Ravi Pendikor at the University of Ottawa and I wrote uh, our very first paper uh, using this kind of data called The Color of Money. And in that paper, we established that visible minorities earn less than white workers in Canada. And although not super surprising, this uh, seemed to be an important paper because there was almost no knowledge about that kind of disparity in Canada. But a disadvantage of the public use microdata is that it was kind of a small number of observations we had to work with. We got about 2% of the population of Canada to analyze there. And so later when we wanted to extend this work in another paper called Color My World, we used an in with Statistics Canada. Um, so we had connections in government because at that time, Ravi Pendikar, my co-author worked in government. And so he sat in a lonely cubicle in the basement of Tunney's pasture, working on the actual full database of the Canadian censuses. Um, and uh, this was about, seven times as much data, and so we were able to say a lot more. But a huge disadvantage of this um, 
this kind of work in that area era before the RDC is that you needed connections. You needed to know someone. And uh, because of that, it was not easy for this kind of work to be replicated. So the RDCs came along uh, in 2000 and have been running for 20 years. And in that period, Ravi and I have written nine other papers about minority and immigrant disparity in Canada, uh, including three papers that have focused on indigenous economic issues. Um, this paper, this work that uh, has been possible through the RDC um, has uh, been closely connected with policy. So the work related to the color of money on interethnic disparities in Canada spurred a literature on minority disparity and was used in the federal multiculturalism program and fed the employment equity debate that led to um, revision of the Employment Equity Act. Our paper, Aboriginal Incomes in Canada, um, which used RDC data and was only possible because of the RDC data because Aboriginal people are a very small population in Canada. And studying small populations is only possible if you have a very large sample, so that even if you take a small subset of that large sample, you still got enough observations to work with. And this work um, attuned researchers, especially economists who are interested in Indigenous issues, to the possibilities in the RDC for quantitative investigation of Indigenous economic issues. Now, up to this point, most of the work uh, in the area of um, Indigenous economic issues and Indigenous social issues was qualitative, and that's because quantitative data simply were not available. And the RDCs have made it possible to study um, a lot of Indigenous issues that were previously uh, invisible. In a very recent paper uh, about the Canada Child Benefit expansion in 2016, um, I used consumption data from the RDCs to learn about how households used the money that was delivered to them by the expansion of the Canada Child Benefit. Not surprisingly, we found that households put food on the table. The expansion of the Canada Child Benefit resulted in food in the mouths of children. But a little bit surprisingly, we found that the dominant effect was actually that households improved the housing that they were living in. More housing, better housing, in response to this very predictable and long-term increase in their incomes. This work was used in British Columbia's basic income pilot project to inform future basic incomes policy and likely will be part of the Canadian conversation on basic incomes policy. The RDC's future is pretty bright. Um, recently, uh, quite a lot of longitudinal data of the type that Valerie alluded to as essential uh, has become available um, through a linkage of tax data across years so that you can follow an individual tax filer over many years and you can follow their children. And an important new kind of uh, research that is made possible by this is the study of intergenerational transmission of inequality and all kinds of intergenerational uh, issues. One direction that I would love to see the RDCs go is greater integration and linking with provincial data. Of course, it's a federation, so the federal government collects some data, and a lot of that has entered the RDCs, but provincial governments also collect a lot of data, much of it administrative. And if we were able to link provincial health data or provincial uh, public assistant receipts data with um, data sets that are already in the RDC, um, we would be able to learn a lot about um, health causes and consequences of other kinds of inequalities. So we might learn about the short and long-term consequences of COVID-19. We might learn about health inequalities in a, a richer and more expansive way. One direction that I would love to see the RDC go in terms of um, the way they operate and their, uh, their kind of way of being is that I would like, love to see the RDCs trust researchers more vis-a-vis -vis privacy issues. Of course, the RDCs are very focused on maintaining the privacy of Canadians um, in, uh, in their data. We don't ever want to disclose information that would allow us to learn anything about any individual Canadian. And our disclosure rules, the rules that govern release of data from the RDCs, are oriented at protecting that kind of information, protecting that on an anonymity and confidentiality. But these disclosure rules are by and large um, constructed with cross-tabular analysis in mind. 
And in general, regression analysis is much less risky on privacy grounds. Um, in general, because regression is a kind of data compression. It compresses out complexity in the data to something much simpler. And when we do that kind of data compression, the scope for revealing anything about any individual is much, much diminished. And it would be great to see uh, disclosure rules um, in the RDCs that recognize this distinction. Another way that we could trust researchers more is to uh, improve the access to RDC data. I mentioned before that in the before times you needed an in or a connection with Statistics Canada to get anywhere with these uh, data sets. And the presence of the RDC has democratized access in a really good way that facilitates more researchers accessing the data, but also facilitates um, uh, uh, replicability and double checking of findings. Um, we could improve that even more if we chose um, uh, even greater access rules. For example, um, in Sweden, any Swedish researcher with a crypto card can access um, Swedish uh, administrative microdata from anywhere in the country, not just the RDC. And the Swedes have had no data breaches, um, to my knowledge. And so greater access with respecting confidentiality and privacy is possible. And I would love to see the RDCs move in that direction. So thanks very much. Uh, great to have an opportunity to talk about the awesomeness of the RDCs. And I look forward to the question period. Thank you very much, Krishna, for your remarks. Of course, I'm very all interested also in intergenerational transmission of inequality. And uh, very enthusiastic about the possibilities there. And of course, all your words regarding access were well taken. It me fait plaisir d'inviter Monsieur Guy Bergeron, conseiller stratégique et directeur par intérim, direction de la recherche au ministère du Travail, de l'Emploi et de la Solidarité sociale du gouvernement du Québec, à vous adresser la parole. Guy est économiste spécialisé en développement de capital humain. Il a participé activement aux travaux récents du comité d'experts sur le revenu minimum garanti et poursuit actuellement des travaux sur les politiques de protection sociale et sur les questions entourant le faible revenu. Guy will speak for six to seven minutes. Guy parle pendant six ou sept minutes. Guy, à vous la parole. Je vous remercie. Euh, bonjour. Euh, ma présentation euh, va porter sur la contribution des données administratives du ministère aux activités de recherche, et en particulier en matière de recherche institutionnelle. Euh, le ministère que je représente a comme principale mission de favoriser l'atteinte des relations de travail, euh, de favoriser l'équilibre dans l'offre et la demande de main dœuvre de diffuser une information pertinente sur le marché du travail, de mettre en place des services d'emploi, de favoriser l'inclusion économique et sociale des personnes les plus vulnérables et de soutenir l'action communautaire. Ça fait beaucoup et en plus, le ministère offre également aux citoyens et aux entreprises un guichet multiservice au service public. Euh, notre ministère abrite également depuis 2005 le Centre d'études sur la pauvreté et l'exclusion. Euh, le CPE qu'on appelle est un organisme de recherche qui découle de la loi visant à lutter contre la pauvreté et l'exclusion sociale. Euh, le centre réalise un suivi d'indicateurs devant servir à mesurer la pauvreté et l'exclusion sociale, les inégalités sociales et économiques, dont les écarts de revenus et les autres déterminants de la pauvreté. Euh, le centre publie annuellement un état de situation sur les indicateurs de pauvreté, les inégalités et l'exclusion sociale au Québec. Le centre publie également des avis sur des questions de pauvreté et d'exclusion et aussi des recherches permettant d'approfondir les connaissances relatives à la pauvreté et l'exclusion sociale. Euh, notre ministère détient des données administratives, bien sûr, sur les missions qui sont en lien avec le régime de sécurité sociale. On parle ici de l'assistance sociale. Euh, le ministère détient des données standardisées sur l'aide financière de dernier recours qui sont accordées depuis 1996. On parle donc de 25 ans d'histoire. Les services publics d'emploi, depuis 1998, on a des données standardisées sur la participation et sur l'engagement financier réalisé par le ministère. C'est 22 ans de données. 
le régime québécois d'assurance parentale maintenant en place depuis 2006, c'est d'autres données standardisées, employeur-employé, sur la participation au régime. 15 ans. On a des avantages avec les euh, données administratives. Euh, c'est des données populationnelles, c'est des données mensuelles dans le cas de l'aide sociale, c'est des données hebdomadaires au service public d'emploi et au régime québécois d'assurance parentale. Euh, c'est des séries chronologiques qui portent sur de longues périodes, on l'a mentionné. Une utilisation de descriptifs sociodémographiques aussi qui sont standardisés dans le temps, qui ne bougent pas trop. Euh, des informations détaillées sur la situation des bénéficiaires et sur les services reçus, des liens avec des données périphériques pour les employeurs, pour les ménages, etc. Il y a des possibilités d'associer des données individuelles avec d'autres données, comme par exemple des données fiscales. Euh, mais ces données-là, euh, les données administratives, comportent aussi des inconvénients. Euh, notre population est souvent limitée aux prestataires des services. Donc, les non-bénéficiaires n'y sont pas. Il y a beaucoup de personnes impliquées dans ces idées d'information, ce qui pourrait impliquer des risques d'erreur, des précisions, qui pourraient compromettre l'intégrité de certaines variables. Et finalement, on a aussi de l'accessibilité qui est limitée aux données. Euh, des chercheurs externes, institutionnels, qui cherchent à obtenir des données administratives, se but à des démarches administratives importantes. Euh, la loi sur, provinciale, ici, la loi sur l'accès aux documents des organismes publics, et sur la protection des renseignements personnels, impose des démarches administratives importantes aux chercheurs pour l'obtention de données administratives. Alors, la plupart des demandes chez nous doivent euh, passer euh, à la commission d'accès à l'information avant d'être traitées, ce, ce qui signifie des délais importants à prévoir. Mais tout compte fait, les données administratives procurent en général plus d'avantages que des convenants. Et en tant qu'économiste, j'ai appris qu'il faut mieux avoir des informations imparfaites que pas d'informations du tout. Un vieux d'âge. Nos actions. Euh, les activités de recherche judiciaire contribuent notamment à soutenir la recherche institutionnelle. Hein? On l'a mentionné. Voici quelques exemples récents. Euh, une étude systémique euh, du bien-être des couples parentaux. On parle de plus de 1000 couples avec enfants. Le soutien paternel à l'autonomie portant sur 1000 pères ayant eu recours au régime québécois d'assurance parentale. Une étude portant sur l'interaction entre les partenaires de jeunes enfants, 210 familles biparentales de nouveaux-nés, dans une perspective longitudinale. Euh, L'évaluation des impacts euh, sur la santé et les modifications du programme d'aide sociale au Québec. Euh, C'était une demande d'appareillement de fichier. Euh, il y a aussi une recherche sur le développement des enfants et la transition en milieu scolaire. 150 enfants dans ce cas-ci. Les enjeux du parcours de l'intégration des demandeurs d'asile au Québec. Là, on parle de 32 000 personnes euh, qui sont interrogées. Euh, une étude dont je suis sur le devenir des jeunes placés au Québec. 2272 jeunes échantillonnés. Euh, on a d'autres projets qui sont également en cours, qui portent sur les prestataires de l'assistance sociale et les participants au service public d'emploi. Euh, certains de ces projets demandent la constitution de bases de données d'envergure. On parle de big data en bon français. Euh, depuis l'automne 2017, on mentionne aussi que le ministère collabore au programme de recherche des Ability, Employment and Public Policies Initiative, le DPI en, en acronyme. C'est un projet qui est né d'une proposition conjointe des instituts de recherche en santé du Canada et du conseil de recherche en sciences humaines. Euh, C'est un projet qui vise à obtenir une meilleure compréhension de l'intégration, de la participation et du maintien des personnes ayant des incapacités sur le marché du travail. Euh, la contribution ici du ministère, c'était de, de créer une base de données de taille considérable, encore une big data, sur plusieurs années. 20 ans, si ma mémoire est bonne. Et ça demandait aussi euh, d'apporter des informations sur un groupe de contrôle. Alors, euh, en termes de perspective, euh, pour notre ministère, on a une mission de recherche euh, qui vise à offrir aux chercheurs institutionnels conseils et soutien dans l'élaboration de leurs demandes d'informations et de données. Euh, ça demande donc euh, une grande collaboration, une saine collaboration aussi entre le ministère et les chercheurs institutionnels et ça demeure pour nous une priorité et un gage de succès. Euh, nous comptons suivre de près l'évolution de la législation aussi en matière de protection des renseignements personnels. Le projet de loi 64, modernisant des dispositions législatives en matière de protection des renseignements personnels, est présentement l'étude au Québec. Euh, 
la loi qui a été modifiée, date de 1982. Alors, ça commence à être euh, une vieille loi. Il semble y avoir une ouverture de la part du législateur pour une utilisation des données administratives dépersonnalisées aux fins de recherche. Alors, compte tenu des changements qui s'annoncent, nous comptons faire évoluer nos pratiques en matière de soutien à la recherche institutionnelle. Euh, je vous remercie de votre attention. J'attends vos questions. Merci. Merci, Guy, pour ces perspectives. Les innovations au Québec sont toujours d'un intérêt particulier. Thanking the speakers again, this concludes the pre-recorded portion of the spotlight on poverty, homelessness, and housing issues. We invite you to please stand by as we transition to the live Q&A session with our panelists. If you have yet to do so, please submit your questions. The live Q&A is starting now. Hi, we're all back and live now. And good to see everyone. And I think I'll start with a question that actually Guy proposed uh, to the others, except I'm going to add a little bit to it to combine it with another question. So Guy, uh, starting with Guy's question, what are the key challenges in the determinants of health from a poverty and a homelessness perspective? Uh, what are the main areas of uh, missing data? And I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the combination of provincial and federal data and pro prospects there at the same time. So, Jim, do you think you could start with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, one of the things that happens every year it, between CMHC and um, Statistics Canada is that they go and they try to calculate core housing need. Um, and core housing need, there's three ways you can get into core housing need in Canada. The number one reason, the reason that people get into court housing need is because of affordability problems. And affordability standard is uh, asks whether you spend more than 30% of your gross income on shelter costs, then you are considered in core housing need. That is, you know, a, a well-established benchmark, but there's lots of questions about that benchmark. It would actually be really helpful to know uh, on a, to have a, a continuous distribution of what is it that people are spending on uh, housing relative to other to their uh, to their gross income, and this actually speaks directly to some of the work that Valerie has done, where indeed post shelter disposable income uh, is an incredibly determined important determinant of, of food insecurity. So post shelter disposable income may actually be the most important part of housing costs. The other thing I think that would be really interesting to know uh, and have better data on from a uh, from a policy perspective would be a better understanding of where housing subsidies are going. And housing sub by housing subsidies, I don't mean direct no. subsidies, uh, uh, rent geared to income direct subsidies. I actually mean um, subsidies that are due to tax exemptions and, and other um, sorts of, uh, of, of revenues that aren't collected. So the chief one is the um, capital gains exemption on the primary residence, which uh, is a, by many accounts a very, very large subsidy to relatively well-off households and that there's no comp it would be useful to know what would be something similar that we could be spending on the rental uh, side of things so that's those are a couple of things off the top of my head that i think would be really important that we lack currently so just because i perhaps combined too much in the question i want to make sure we get to the health part which was so oh, yeah that, that he was focusing on yeah sure well without question so uh, basically, the way I think about it from a health perspective is we've got a very strong relationship between income and health, and we would probably see an even stronger one if we looked at post-shelter disposable income because, um, you know, basically the way we think about it from a housing perspective is for low-income households in particular, housing costs are the often one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, monthly expenditure. And in addition to that, they're very inelastic. So if money is yeah. short in a particular month, you can't say, oh, I'm only going to occupy 600 square feet of my, uh, of my 800 square foot apartment this month and save 25% on my rent in order to be able to pay for food or recreational or medications, right? Which is another thing that often gets, um, there's all kinds of uh, essentially, uh, they call it discounting health. So the way we talk about it is the people who faced high 
housing costs, shelter costs relative to income tend to discount their health in really important ways. I sound like an economist, don't I, Mike? Huh. Valerie. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I want to uh, take on Jim's enthusiasm about post-shelter um, income. Um, this is actually a great example of what we've gained from being in the RDC. We did a piece of work years ago in Toronto that had the findings that Jim's remembering, I think. Um, but work that we've done looking with um, looking at the Canada um, the household, the survey of household spending. So looking at household expenditures for food and housing and all kinds of other things. And there was a year, one year, when uh, the food and security module was included on that survey. And so Andre and Fafar Saint Germain did an analysis there. And in fact, we gained nothing from looking at post shelter income. So that's a case where, with bigger samples and a broader. Um, more variation. We've actually gained some insight that's taken us in a place that we didn't necessarily anticipate. Going back to the original question though around health, I guess for me there are two pieces to the answer to Guy's cat question. From a, a research perspective, I feel like we need longitudinal data that almost everything we're doing looking at the relationship between income or food insecurity and health is cross-sectional and it's become almost um, not worth doing now to make those correlations because they're so obvious. But we don't know very much about the life course and the cumulative effects of, um, of low income and interventions along the path. And so I think longitudinal data is critical and I think Canada particularly falls down on that front. The other thing though that I can't help but say is we really need some work to figure out how it is that this wealth of insight that we've garnered through all these years and these millions of taxpayers' dollars of investments and in research in the RDCs actually translate into policy. I feel like that is like a gigantic hole and we can get better at kind of, you know, making the mouse trap. but we really have to tackle, I think, this bigger question of the translation of the work that people like us do into something bigger. Krishna. Um, it's interesting to me that uh, these other folks who uh, are focused in large measure on health uh, stuff and health inequality are, are uh, interested in consumption. I mean, you're talking about the confluence of food, food insecurity, um, uh, spending, shelter, all these things. So this is the sort of information that we gather in the surveys of household spending, but those data sets have been historically underused. I mean, they're, they're not very popular. They're not very large. They're not linked with anything else. Um, and so uh, it seems like um, for thinking about health inequalities, uh, we might well uh, gain something by linking the surveys of household spending to uh, uh, health data like uh, administrative provincial health data sets. Um, that of course is difficult. That brings, brings us to the issue of how do you get uh, federal government to talk to provincial governments in any kind of productive way that actually spans all 10 or, or, or 13 jurisdictions, depending how you think about it. Um, and uh, that that's a big lift, um, getting both getting computer systems to talk to each other and getting uh, bureaucrats to talk to each other. Um, but I think it's worth pursuing. There, there has been lots of investigation on, on, uh, on British Columbia and Ontario uh, administrative health data sets, but they've lacked this connection to uh, federal data sets. Similarly with income assistance and stuff like that, I mean, at least that one, it's transparent how you link them because everybody has a social insurance number that is used to key the income assistance data sets in all provinces, but we still haven't done it. And so um, I think there's lots of room and lots of low hanging fruit um, for linking provincial data to federal data, but it's it's going to take a big effort on some politician's part to make it happen, because it, it won't happen without uh, political backing, um, which gets you the bureaucratic uh, cooperation. Guy, I was wondering whether you'd like to comment. Uh, no, they, they, they answered quite well. Uh, it's not a it's not a simple issue, and uh, we know we have a lot of data, but uh, the linking parts 
in some ways the, the burden uh, on the research part. And also uh, we talk about uh, policies. Uh, you're right, um, uh, Valérie, uh, you got a, a big issue there. We have to work a lot to to be um, to be uh, positively uh, uh, in the boat, uh, you know, <laughs> making things right uh, in this uh, issues. It's uh, not a uh, simple issues anyway. Thank you uh, for your answers, uh, guys. So I have a question from uh, Celine Plant uh, for Valerie. Uh, Valerie, in your presentation, you show recent migrants that used to be less at risk for food insecurity in CCHS, but recent results from a web panel survey during the COVID period, September 2020, indicate migrants are one of the subgroups that are most at risk for moderate to severe food insecurity. Apart from job loss, would you have any hypotheses for this? Well, I think the simple answer to that question is whether you're doing multivariable analysis or not. I think what you're describing with the more recent output is something that's just uh, frequency distributions. But where we see the protective effect actually of, of immigration in relationship to food insecurity is when we run multivariable models where we're adjusting for income and income source and things like that. So I think they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're different, um, they're different understandings of the relationship because they're different, um, they're different analyses. I think it's really, really important that we run multivariable analyses when we're looking at, you know, sociodemographic characteristics in relationship to food insecurity to gain insight into how they play out, you know, in tandem. Thank you, Valerie. I have a question from Marie Connolly. Uh, and I'm going to try it in both languages. So first en français, uh, vous avez, it's for Guy. Uh, vous avez parlé de l'étude sur le développement des enfants et la transition à l'école. Quelle uh, et transition à l'école? Uh, quel genre de données vous avez à ce sujet au Mites? So the translation, you spoke of a study on child development and translation. And, and transition to school. You spoke about study on child development and transition to school. What type of data do you have on this subject at your ministry? Um, for this kind of study, uh, we have to uh, to merge some data from uh, other sources. It's not me who have done the, the job, but uh, we uh, focus on the social assistant recipients who have uh, young children uh, at home. and. That's what our part was. So it's not uh, one thing that we have. Uh, just add a little uh, information on uh, these issues. But the, the, the research was really larger than the, the, just that the, the sole contribution of the, the department here. So uh, that's a, a way of. Uh, of working with uh, administrative data, you know, we, we don't have so many things to say uh, with our data. Uh, we have to uh, merge them with uh, some other data uh, from uh, Statistics Canada, whatever. And that's the, the, the complicated part of the, the story. Uh, answer. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question from Melissa Kelly. Uh, it's for Jim. Are there opportunities for organizations outside universities that don't have access to RDCs, like municipalities, to take advantage of the Canadian Housing Evidence Collaborative? collaborative? Um, I mean, certainly you can partner with the university folks, and I believe it's also possible for municipalities to uh, and other organizations to get in. There tends to be there is a um, cost recovery fee, although it's not that. Uh, it's not that daunting. In fact, I was just putting together a proposal recently with a, a not-for-profit consulting company, and we were imagining having to pay the fees, and I was, I was surprised at how affordable they were. So without question, um, probably the best way, though, is to partner with a university researcher uh, who might have a similar question. I'd be more than happy if it was, especially if it was housing-related, be more than happy to talk to you. So please email me at jim.dunn at mcmaster.ca. I'm easy, I'm easy to find. <laughs> 
Uh, so we have a, a, a fairly general question here for, from our audience. Uh, it is first in the first place directed at Guy, uh, but is a, there's a request for others as well, and I will again try it. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a une disparité entre la pauvreté, entre les différentes provinces? Uh, translation, is there a disparity in poverty rates and trends among different provinces? So I guess the idea is, is, is there a lot in common across the provinces or are, are the differences going to predominate? Well, it's poverty, you. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not so easy to, to answer. Uh, it's not so easy to answer. We've got, we've got, we've got a lot of consumption as a measure. Uh, basket major uh, from uh, Stats of Canada. Uh, we can compare uh, our, our results in Quebec and uh, in Ontario, or whatever. But, you know, it's not so simple to answer to that. Uh, the poverty measure is not something that we are we can easily uh, target, you know, you, you have to uh, check revenue, but also uh, uh, health and uh, some other issues like uh, rent and things like that. So it's not a simple one. Does any, anybody else? Sorry. Yeah, any, any I was others? just wondering if anybody else wanted to chime in on that. Is there, yeah. have they noticed an important difference across provinces that, uh, uh, See, seeks to suggest that there would be differential analysis by province as opposed to more of a yeah. national analysis. Go with uh, Krishna. Yes. Um, well, you know, the, the provinces all have different uh, degrees of uh, activity and intervention on poverty and homelessness. So they all have different systems of income transfers ranging from no additional income transfers uh, to some additional income transfers. And these are layered on top of uh, uh, a web of federal income transfers that are aimed at reducing income poverty. Um, now, Guy was saying that income poverty is one of the things you'd want to uh, measure and track and worry about. And there are other things too, because there are other kinds of important deprivation. But the fact that there's variation in policy across provinces uh, does result in variation in poverty rates across provinces. But the, the biggest change in um, the way we do uh, transfers to low-income households has been a federal one. And that was a federal policy change in 2016 that massively increased the Canada Child Benefit. Mm -hmm. And that resulted in a nationwide decline in poverty for all people, and particularly in a nationwide decline in poverty for children. In British Columbia, that decline was half. The child poverty rate fell by half following the expansion of the Canada Child Benefit. So, um, yeah. There's a national component, and it's driven by national policy, and then there's provincial variation driven by uh, variation in provincial policy and by variation in, in provincial economies. For a long period, Alberta had lower poverty rates than the rest of Canada. It was not because Alberta was more generous with its poverty relief system. It was because Alberta's economy was uh, hotter than the rest of Canada for some time. That has now flipped on its head. Wait, so, can I make a comment? Sure. Go ahead, Valerie. Um, one of the things that is interesting from a food insecurity standpoint is we always see variation in prevalence estimates across provinces, but when we, um, and the most recent um, national data that we have from 2017-18 actually shows Quebec as having a substantially lower prevalence of food insecurity than, than other provinces in Canada, and certainly considerably lower than the territories. But one thing that's interesting, for years now in the food insecurity literature, when people have done multivariable analyses, not that they're necessarily looking at provincial policies per se, but they've adjusted. Um, and repeatedly we see that after taking into account things like income, employment, um, housing circumstances, 
Quebec, living in Quebec is protective against food insecurity. And like I say, not to say that it's perfect, not by a long shot. There's still, I think the most recent estimate is something like 11% of households in Quebec pre-COVID were reporting some level of food insecurity. But it's interesting. I mean, it's an example of something that really merits much, much more examination because while, I mean, I hear what Krishna is saying in terms of the, the power of these federal interventions, it is fascinating to those of us studying food insecurity to see this continual Quebec effect surfacing once we get big models running. So that's one example of provincial variation that I feel like merits a whole lot more looking. Okay, so uh, we would be at two o'clock now, but we do have some questions uh, still overhanging. So we thought if everyone's okay, we're gonna go for another 10 minutes, maybe, maybe a couple more than that uh, to uh, see if we can finish some more questions. Uh, so the next question was going to be for Krishna and Valerie, and it asks, uh, can you imagine innovative presentations of homelessness data that could be effective for policymakers to translate data to policy, uh, e.g. comparative expenditure infographics? And I'm going to expand that to also ask Jim on that one as well. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Krishna. Um, well, here in British Columbia, we uh, do collect uh, distinct kinds of information about homelessness. Um, we've been running homeless counts for the last um, 15 years or so in Vancouver, and then in Greater Vancouver and Victoria, and now in Prince George. So there's um, increased attention to this particular kind of deprivation, which is extreme deprivation, and counting and characterizing that um, relatively small subpopulation. And when it comes to thinking about well, how do we connect those kind of data with policy? One very stark finding that comes from the Vancouver homeless counts is that in uh, 2018 and 2019, that's pre-COVID, almost half of the homeless uh, population in, in Vancouver said that their previous place of residence was a different province. And so that suggests that the sense that uh, the government of Canada has that maybe getting out of the uh, housing business uh, in the early 90s um, is, was not such a good idea and getting back into the housing business now in a national way um, is, is important, is, is, is really important because it kind of, it's telling us that at least somewhat um, the lower mainland, perhaps because of the favorable weather, uh, and to some extent Vancouver Island, again, because of favorable weather in comparison with the rest of Canada, um, is, is drawing um, from a Canadian population of people in distress and not just a local population. And that means that the funding to take care of this problem needs to be national. And so there's a very close link between the data that we're able to collect, very simple data, uh, and the kinds of policy that we need to address the problem. It also uh, solves a puzzle because the government of British Columbia has been very active in trying to house people over the last three years. Uh, for example, they've plunked down um, 1,500 units of modular housing in, uh, in the province. Um, and even though they plunked down 1,500 units, which were only for people who were currently homeless, so you're, you're removing a person from the homeless population and putting them in shelter, nonetheless, our homeless counts have been rising. And so for a provincial policymaker, there's a kind of puzzlement here. Why does increased action result, you know, it's kind of a ripoff. And it's because this is a national problem. Valerie and then Jim. Mike, I'll pass over to Jim. I don't have anything very insightful to um, offer and I'd be interested in hearing his, his response. You're going to have to repeat the questions for me, Mike, because I, I got so entranced with what Krishna was saying. <laughs> it was pretty interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, so the question is basically uh, about presenting uh, homelessness data in a way that motivates policy. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, I think some of the, the data that's been most interesting in this area has been 
just what it costs for people to be homeless. Um, you know, and there was a very, very, uh, it's it, because it's, it's actually very costly to maintain homelessness, if you like. There was a very famous uh, article written in the New Yorker, I believe it was by Malcolm Gladwell uh, about uh, this guy named Murray in, um, I believe it was in New Jersey. And a couple of police officers followed a homeless, this homeless man, Murray. Um, they followed him around for a year and they tried to count up all of the services that he used over the course of a year. And then they tried to cost it. And they basically came to the conclusion it was about a million dollars <laughs> to keep Murray homeless. And so, uh, so I think that's one of the things that actually is probably the most compelling is just the, the, the cost of, of keeping someone homeless. And, you know, uh, Gladwell's conclusion was, this is a problem that's actually easier to solve than it is to manage. And so, and we've got now actually lots of good studies that have shown, um, and in particular, the, the at-home chez soi study, which was a national demonstration project funded by the, um, uh, the Mental Health Commission of Canada, did a randomized trial in five cities across Canada looking at uh, a very specific model of supported housing for people with severe mental illness and addictions who were homeless. And it showed that for people with severe needs, uh, the cost of the program was actually lower than the cost avoided in other sectors. And interestingly, the biggest costs were not, the avoided were not in the health sector, they are actually in criminal justice and policing. And so, um, you know, this all kind of speaks to the potential of linked data if we were able to actually track these things in larger populations and get outside of you know the mere um, anecdote of Million Dollar Murray uh, and uh, and look at this uh, on, at scale, then we'd actually have uh, maybe even a better case to make. Um, so I, I think that's probably one of the things that uh, that links the the link data issue to uh, to homelessness. But it's certainly a challenging one uh, because homeless people uh, in the first instance, or people who are experiencing homeless uh, homelessness, are uh, inherently difficult to track down and and attach to data. So just while I have you, Jim, there's a yeah. question just came in from Rafael sure. Renting, and yeah. that uh, what research is currently being being done on intergenerational transfer of poverty wealth and temporary permanent housing. So the link between intergenerational uh, and housing. Um, as, as far as I know, not a ton. Um, I, again, there's a lot of anecdotes now that are saying that in the major metropolitan areas where housing costs have now, you know, they're something to the order of six times, uh, the, uh, they've grown uh, six times faster than incomes have over the past several years in the major metropolitan areas in Canada, um, where there is, uh, there's this increasingly documented phenomenon where, of course, uh, people are taking equity out of their homes, giving it to their children so that they can buy into the market. And so that's something that we don't have a strong uh, sense of. And I'm not even sure that it's even very well tracked within tax data. Um, so I, I think this is an area where we could actually be strengthening the data uh, you know, a, a, another example where um, where we don't have a lot of information that just is kind of similar is in secondary properties. So for the longest time, you know, one of the biggest problems we've had with uh, increasing housing prices is people buying secondary properties. And uh, there was very lax enforcement on the uh, capital gains uh, that they would have to pay. And it was it's not really, there wasn't even, I don't even think there was a line in the tax form for it. There now is. And so all of these things are things that we ought to be adding to our data collection in order to be able to capture these sorts of things. Um, but Krishna would probably know the details of, of the tax forms better than I for things like, you know, gifts to family members and uh, for down payments and those, those sorts of things. Krishna, do you want to make a remark there? Um, I would like to make a remark to, on the previous um, point, and that is that um, I, I agree that there are, there are dollars to be saved by um, housing people, but pushing too hard on that is a little risky. For example, um, yes, police contacts are lower when, um, when we house people who were previously homeless. That's a fact. However, when's the last time you heard of a police force shrinking? You know, so uh, we, we, we may get more efficient use of our police officers, but we may not get less money spent in policing or similarly less money spent on healthcare or similarly less money spent on uh, the judicial system. 
there's a, a disjoint between less demand for those services and less money spent on them. No, totally. I, I would agree completely with that if I can, can respond. But I think what's happening increasingly is there's actual conversations that are happening between the police sector and the mental health sector to be able to say, you know, listen, can we have you, instead of doing what the police call wellness checks that sometimes result in violent conflict, can we have that replaced with a wellness check that is by a mental health worker instead of a police officer? And so those are the, I think, we're, we've seen a wedge started to happen. Um, and you know the, the term defund the police is a misnomer. It's actually reallocate the policing resources to better support people and to deal with mental health issues as mental health issues. And you know there's a whole uh, uh, naughty set of problems in the criminal justice system with people who are on remand, who are released from jail and so forth and homelessness and the, the, just the perpetuation of their um, of their marginalization. So without question, I think I agree with you completely. The other danger in this is that there are people who, and this is where the rights-based argument for housing, people who are experience homeless and under housing is really important, is there are people for whom if we house them, it would actually cost more and it wouldn't save any money. And so if we just are let, resting it on the basis of savings, then I think we have some real problems. And people with developmental disabilities are, are in particular kind of top of that list as far as I'm concerned. It would probably cost a lot more, uh, but in Ontario alone, there's a wait list of 14,000 people waiting for supported housing who have developmental disabilities. And uh, they are no less entitled to that than, uh, than people who might save the system money if we, uh, if we house them. So I, I think we can't just rest on those arguments. So I, I think we're in agreement on that, Krishna. Thanks for raising that. So we only have a couple of minutes. So I'm gonna give Valerie fair warning that I'm gonna give her the last question in a moment, which is <laughs> gonna be about how, how COVID-19 affects all this. Uh, but in the meantime, I have a quite specific question to ask Guy. One of them comes from, it's a paired question. One of them comes from Robbie Bryden, who Jim referred to earlier, and another is from somebody else in the audience. And, and the question is about, uh, uh, how one can access the, the data that you're referring to in, in the Quebec ministry? And uh, is there a prospect for that data coming to the RDCs? Okay, as I said uh, before, um, uh, we got a, a, a new bill on the table at uh, the National Assembly. They are working on it. And uh, there's a, a a uh, guy from uh, University of Laval, Université Laval, um, uh, Prof. Uh, Desiel, and uh, he had submitted a brief to the Committee on Institution that uh, studied uh, the bill right now. And uh, he proposed two things, because what we have to know is that um, uh, the personal information that uh, denominized and uh, anonymized uh, information that we can give to the uh, a searcher, a researcher, uh, would be uh, heard by the, the commission uh, on the base of the project. So uh, that means a, a researcher who has a lot of uh, project in, in his uh, pocket, you know, uh, will have to go and go and go again with us uh, to uh, carry some uh, data, uh, one project at a time. So, uh, Mr. Pierre-Luc Desiel, who is an associate professor of law and uh, privacy specialist at University Laval, uh, proposed to the commission that the legislative framework should allow access to personal information on the basis of research programming instead of research project base. That's one key solution that he, he finds, and that the access to personal information should not be limited to only to necessary data, because uh, we, we have to uh, follow the law. Uh, so not limited to only necessary data, but to data relevant to research purposes. That means that uh, someone who want to carry about uh, big data, artificial intelligence, and uh, just uh, make some uh, cross-section uh, uh, comparison, uh, that could be a good answer to have uh, some uh, kind of uh, new prospect with uh, this uh, kind of law. 
we have to protect uh, the privacy of the information from the, our citizen, but uh, can we do something more for researchers? That's uh, the big question, actually. We, it's on the table right now. And Valerie, uh, a last word or two about how COVID changes the way forward. Wow. First of all, thank you very, very much for the question, whoever asked it. Um, I have to say, as somebody who works in the area of food insecurity, COVID is a very, very terrifying thing. Everything we knew about food insecurity in Canada before COVID suggested that people impacted by food insecurity through the changes that, have, that we've seen through with COVID will be two things. There will be more of them and they will be more severely food insecure and other manifestations of their deprivation have to be mushrooming. That said, one of the first things that happened with the um, shutdown in Canada around the pandemic was the cessation of data collection from CCHS, our primary window into this problem. <laughs> We've had, so what have we got? We've got a problem that from years of research with everything we know would suggest this thing is, is, is very many times worse and that these people are very, very vulnerable to the changes that we've seen play out, both from a health perspective and an economic perspective. And of course, those things intertwining, but we've turned out the lights on the problem. So we have no window into it at all. What have we seen in terms of federal response? Well, you know, you know, huge announcements of money, including some absolutely unprecedented um, public funds being allocated to food charity efforts in Canada. First an announcement in April and then one more recently a few weeks ago. Um, but with absolutely no data collection to support them and no evaluations of where they're, how they're working. I mean, it, this is a terrifying problem. And one, th one of the things that really concerns me going forward is that we'll never pick up what we have lost in the um, cessation of data collection now. So some of the ravages of this thing, I don't know how we're actually gonna figure out when we finally get it together to get back in the field with the surveys that we're monitoring, health and well-being of people most deprived. I don't know how we'll ever retrace our steps as to the things that have happened over these last seven months. So um, it's a huge problem and it and it it's front and center with the kinds of data gathering activities that we've all been talking about today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Valerie. And thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I really appreciate the, the answers to the questions I thought were really fascinating and, and very important. And so I uh, also like to thank the audience uh, who, who came and, and participated. And uh, again, I thought it was a very good session. Uh, I invite everybody to join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. and from there the spotlight will be on Indigenous issues. So thanks again and uh, see you tomorrow. Thanks.